When a man goes to a prostitute, uh, he's seeking something more than a sexual experience. He's seeking affirmation and acceptance. You're running away from real intimacy, uh, the real intimacy of human relationship that God has created. We prefer to live, in a sense, than in a fantasy, fantasy kind of world, whatever expression that may be sexually. Dealing with the rejection that we live with in our own fallen world and relationships is that when we come to God, God is accepting us unconditionally. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is Jonathan Darty, and I'm your host for today's program. If you look at the statistics on sexual addiction, or more biblically put, bondage to sexually immoral behavior, it's looking pretty grim. Even among so-called believers, over half of pastors and lay people are ensnared by the evil one in this regard. People are not putting to death the deeds of the flesh very well at all, as Christians have been commanded to do so by God and Scripture. If we're truly born again believers, the Bible says that we've been given the power, everything we need for godliness, in fact. So what's gone wrong? And it's not just believers who are bound up in this sort of thing. Therapy for sexual addiction has become a cottage industry in our nation. In fact, Nashville, where this ministry is located, is not only the heart of the Bible Belt, it is so bound up in sexual immorality that at least one 12-step organization for sex addicts moved their national headquarters here years ago. What is going on? Why are people running off the cliff like lemmings on this issue? I thought the sexual revolution was going to create more satisfaction and fulfillment in people's sex lives. At least that's what they told us would happen. Recently, we traveled to Colorado Springs to talk with one of the foremost experts on sexual addiction, Dr. Harry Schomburg, who runs a clinic that counsels sex addicts from all over the world. Dr. Schomburg has written several classic books on the subject, including False Intimacy and his newest work, Undefiled. Listen carefully as Dr. Harry Schomburg unpacks for us what the Bible has to say about the problem and what it has to say about the solution. I started working uh, in this area of what I prefer to call sexual sin, sexual addiction, 30 years ago, working in a county agency. At that time, there were no books, uh, there were no terms like sexual addiction, even on the map. Uh, and after doing that for five years, working in a public agency, Patrick Carnes wrote a book, Out of the Shadows. And I got a copy of the book, and I read the book, and I said to myself, sexual addiction, that's what I've been dealing with for five years. Uh, I could have written a book. And uh, I thought I was done with all the sex stuff, as I referred to it, and was headed to New York City to um, uh, start a Christian counseling center, the first Christian counseling center in New York City, and train lay counselors. And Patrick Carnes was doing a workshop in Philadelphia on how to counsel sex addicts. And I was just dying to meet the guy who wrote this book on a subject that I had worked with for five years. And uh, so I, I went to his training. Of course, it was all 12-step and recovery. Uh, I left the training and said, well, I'm done with the sex stuff. Uh, I'm not going to be dealing with that. But that was not the case, because I ended up on a referral list for Patrick Carnes uh, inpatient program in Minneapolis. And people started calling me in New York City, uh, just a steady flow. And so I was put in this position of saying, okay, what is this problem? But what is this problem from a biblical perspective? Uh, and so started thinking through that the next five years, counseling people coming through my office. And, uh, you know, influenced by a number of different people over the years and uh, have become more and more convinced that uh, the concept of disease, as we refer to it, is a great metaphor, but it's not an accurate description uh, that, in terms of how we would understand it biblically. And so I've never really embraced the 12-step program in the 30 years as a professional counselor. Uh, we've been working the last 19 years exclusively uh, counseling people in the area of what would be called sexual addiction and taking a whole different approach. Uh, the new book that came out in September, Undefiled, is, is really based upon those 18 years 
of experience in what we've been doing and saying there's a different way of looking at this problem and a different way for people to change. You know, I think you could use the word bondage um, in that the Bible, as we read it in the English, certainly talks about a bondage to sin. So it, it's, a, it's a good word. Uh, I, I just use the term more and more sexual sin and very carefully use the word sexual addiction when I have a chance to describe it. So I think the word bondage is a good word biblically, but I, I don't know that, uh, I, I, I guess I've never felt comfortable using it uh, for some reason. I would just prefer sexual sin because it is sin. Uh, and whatever way you cut it, whatever way you slice it, it ends up, it's, it's clearly sin. And I, I think we need to emphasize that word sin, which isn't, isn't the most comfortable way to look at yourself in the mirror. I'm a sinner. The first book that I wrote on the subject, False Intimacy, subtitled Understanding the Struggle of Sexual Addiction, uh, really turned out to be the first book, I believe, written on the subject from a biblical perspective. Uh, and it took the 10 years of experience I had at that time and said, okay, how do we approach this subject from a Christian worldview? Uh, what are we really dealing with? Uh, and I looked at it more, and still do, that this is a problem of selfishness, this is a problem of getting something for myself. Not simply the, the sexual pleasure that we would automatically think of, but we really get something in the form of what I call false intimacy, which of course is the title of the book that when a man goes to a prostitute, uh, he's seeking something more than a sexual experience. He's seeking affirmation and acceptance that's inherent in the whole process of soliciting and even the process of being with that prostitute. I think the same thing occurs with an affair. I think the same thing occurs with pornography. It's a false intimacy. And so what I really said in that book is you're running away from real intimacy. Uh, the real intimacy of human relationship that God has created and ultimately running away from the real intimacy uh, in relationship with God. We're creating a false intimacy that we can control on our terms and get what we want, ultimately a, an experience of selfish acceptance where I feel affirmed that I'm taken care of, that I'm okay. Uh, we all want that feeling, we all have that desire, but you can, you can experience it where you control the entire relationship, false intimacy, or you can be in real intimacy where people are gonna like you, not like you, you can't control it, you don't know the outcome. Uh, we prefer to live in a sense than in a fantasy, fantasy kind of world, whatever expression that may be sexually. You're protecting yourself from being rejected, ridiculed, uh, just not being accepted, and, and at the same time getting some kind of affirmation uh, I've counseled hundreds of guys who've gone to prostitutes, and, and it's a good example where the prostitute is literally standing on the street curb, the guy's in his car, and this woman is doing everything she can to say, I want you, I like you, I want to be with you. Uh, and, and if you talk to the guy who goes to the prostitute, he will say, you really, that's what it's all about. Even though I know they're lying through their teeth, I just want to know that this person is interested in me. I actually know of a guy who would drive up to the curb, engage in that interaction, and as soon as they had struck a deal in terms of the price, he would drive away because he'd gotten everything he wanted. He didn't want sex. He wanted that moment and that experience. And then I've counseled guys who've had hundreds, thousands of sexual experiences with prostitutes, and they'll say it's not about the sex. It's about this woman being a good actress and telling me I'm wonderful uh, and, and, and of course, it's a total controlled environment because as long as you pay the money, she'll tell you anything you want to hear. She'll do anything you want. But really, it's what she's saying in, in her actions and in her words that says, you're wonderful, I want you. Did you know that God has provided a way of escape from sexual sin for those who have given their lives to His Son, Jesus Christ? Yes, there is a journey to freedom, purity, and restoration that works. In his book, Undefiled, Dr. Harry Schomburg lays out a path that will take you beyond 12-step programs, accountability groups, and purity pledges, and into the deeper walk with God that brings freedom. 
To get your copy of Undefiled, go to www.purepassion.us. Want to keep up on the latest from Pure Passion? We'd like to extend an invitation to you to join our Facebook and Twitter pages. Just add forward slash Pure Passion TV to the Facebook.com or the Twitter.com address, and there we are. Read our latest news, inspirational postings, or watch a video about sex trafficking, pornography, or some other form of sexual brokenness. We even post photos taken during our mini taping trips. So come like Pure Passion TV on Facebook and Twitter. I think we develop a fear of real intimacy uh, just in the natural process of growing up anywhere, any place, any time, any family, any school, whatever your experience is. And it doesn't have to be a serious, dysfunctional, awful family. We put a lot of emphasis on that in counseling and psychology, the, the destruction of a, of a dysfunctional family and how a person feels rejected. And certainly that's the case in that type of family. But every family, every experience growing up as a child is an experience of living in a fallen world. Uh, and so there is not a perfect intimacy. There is not a perfect acceptance. Uh, and, and what is real, uh, there's always that experience, uh, say on the playground, where you're the last one chosen to be on the baseball team. Uh, and you feel like, well, I'll take him. You know, well, you can have him. I don't want him because you're the last one. You weren't the first picked. And, and so all kinds of different experiences. You could be the most popular kid in the school. You could be the most popular girl in the school. And yet when you talk to those people, there are, there are issues of feeling rejected, not being accepted. It's never enough to be the beauty queen, you know, the football star. You always want more. You always want more. Uh, and, and so where do we get that? Uh, we, we try to create our own little world, our own false intimacy. And an athlete, for example, would maybe turn pro, but he can never retire. He's got to keep playing one more year to have that uh, approval, that acceptance. It's pretty hard just to quit and say, okay, I need to get out of this. I've done this long enough. And I think a lot of what drives that athlete, having counseled a number of professional athletes, is, is really being on stage and having the approval and the acceptance. In many ways, on stage in any form is a form of false intimacy. The audience doesn't really know you prostitute doesn't really know you. Even the woman you're having an affair with, where there's a lot more intimacy and relational connection, doesn't really know you in the real life of, say, raising a family and having to take care of kids and pay the bills. I think when you look at a Christian who is a sex addict, a sexual sinner, I, I think that the challenge that I see in working with that person, and that's pretty much all I work with, um, I, I've counseled non-Christians, but, but at least in the last 19 years, pretty much exclusively Christians. And 40 to 45 percent have been pastors. Uh, and so you not only have a Christian who has all the uh, belief systems, uh, the Christian lifestyle of America functioning, but this is a guy who preaches on a Sunday morning and supposedly is studying the Word of God, knows doctrine from his Bible college seminary training. Uh, and uh, I, I think when you look at a Christian, what's, what's the strangest thing, the, the, the greatest contradiction, is that everything in the gospel conveys the message of acceptance. It, it, in fact, it's the strongest message of acceptance that you'll find anywhere, any place, any time. Be, because the, the message of the gospel is that we are totally depraved, so helpless that we can't even come to God be, because we're so deep in sin. And, and so it takes God reaching out to us, that's acceptance. And then as God reaches out to us and begins to draw us to himself, it's acceptance. Uh, and yet at the same time, if you look at who Jesus is mingling with, he's mingling with sinners. Uh, in Matthew, you have the account where he is actually eating a meal with sinners. And I don't think we get the magnitude of that picture. Uh, he's not there to teach sinners. He's there to eat with sinners. And the Pharisees look at it and go, why, asking his disciples, why is he eating with sinners? And he says, 
I, I came for sinners. So, so God comes to the sinner, the person who is not righteous, and, and offers everything, which is this great message of acceptance. And then he takes us, not because he's transformed us, does he accept us, but he accepts us in effect as a sinner. And if we respond to the work of God in our hearts, then he transforms us. He doesn't, he doesn't accept us because he transformed us. He accepts us because of his mercy and grace. So it's a great message of acceptance. And, and the challenge, and I think the question is, why is that not enough? The, the, the Christian should have the greatest immunity to false intimacy of anyone in the world because we understand that at the deepest core, we do not merit any a love and acceptance of God, and yet we have it. That, that is our most fundamental doctrine, uh, and, and yet it's not enough. So as I look at that related to countless hundreds and hundreds of Christians I've counseled, it seems to me that there is a rebellion, there's a demand that says, in effect, God is not enough. Uh, the gospel is not enough. Uh, I want more. Uh, and, and we're not seeking first the kingdom of God. We're seeking our own kingdom, we're, we're, which is, again, part of that create the world of illusion, fantasy, whether on a computer screen or whether with a prostitute, where I can manufacture my own world uh, kind of close off the rest of the world like I'm behind uh, four walls that nobody can see, even if I'm on a street corner soliciting a prostitute. And, and it's just me and that prostitute, and everything is the way I want it to be. And, and of course, while God accepts us at the deepest level, God also says, nothing about you do I approve of. Uh, and, and I think we take that and we twist it around and we lose the message of acceptance. And then we feel like, well, how could God really be for me? And, and yet he's trying to transform us to, as C.S. Lewis says, the highest standard of holiness ever recorded in human history. But that's acceptance. And yet at the same time, he's saying, I, I, want, you, I want you to be absolutely holy. Somehow we don't handle all that tension and, and we turn again to ourselves in our own self-centered ways. As I've canceled literally thousands of Christians from across America dealing with some kind of sexual sin, I think the key issue for uh, dealing with the rejection that we live with in our own fallen world and relationships is that when we come to God, God is accepting us unconditionally on one hand. And yet at the same time, God is saying now everything has to change. It is, and, and here's the key phrase, it is no longer your will. If you are responding to my reaching out to you, it now has to be completely my will. And, and, and I think that's the most critical issue of transformation is that we are kicking against that, we are rejecting that, we are pushing that away because when it's God's will, it is all God's will. Uh, it, it is no longer my will. And so then you have to question, has the transformation really taken place? Because I'm still stubbornly living the way I want to live. Uh, I mean, take, take a pastor who sat in my office a couple of years ago who was having an adulterous relationship with a secretary. And he, he chose to start this adulterous relationship. It went on for six months. He's acting on his will. He knows that's not God's will. He knows clearly the Bible teaches, thou shalt not commit adultery, but he chooses to do that. At the same time, he's preaching against adultery on Sunday morning. He's meeting with couples in his church who are dealing with adultery, and he's counseling that they should, you know, not be committing adultery. The church is growing, so then he tells himself, God really doesn't care that I'm committing adultery because the church is growing. I, I mean, he's creating his own delusion, really, his own fantasy, his own world, but he's, he's dictating against the very knowledge and doctrine he has of God to say, but this is what I want to do. It's my will. It's what I want to do. And he's not willing to say, but what does God want? Uh, and how do I, in accepting the will of God, live in a broken, fallen world where pastors sometimes aren't as popular as they would like to be? They're rejected by the congregation at one level. They may feel like their sermons are never 
uh, approved of in the way they would like to have approval. Uh, they may not have the relationship they want with their wives. And so create an illusion, create a, create a fantasy. My will, what I want to do versus God's will and what God wants, it, it's, it's like that's, that's too difficult. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. I want to do it my way. Did you know that God has provided a way of escape from sexual sin for those who have given their lives to His Son, Jesus Christ? Yes, there is a journey to freedom, purity, and restoration that works. In his book, Undefiled, Dr. Harry Schomburg lays out a path that will take you beyond 12-step programs, accountability groups, and purity pledges, and into the deeper walk with God that brings freedom. To get your copy of Undefiled, go to www.purepassion.us. If you own an Android device, iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch, we have an awesome gift for you, and it's free. Just go to your favorite app store, do a search for Pure Passion, and download access to over 130 videos, including every episode of Pure Passion TV, plus entire conferences, old TV programs, and more. Listen to files of outstanding lectures on child abuse, homosexuality, and sex addiction. Plus, read and access our websites and our Facebook and Twitter pages. That's the free new app from Pure Passion. It's interesting, probably in the last five, seven years approximately, in our week-long intensive counseling program, because of the things that we teach and, and how some of my teaching has changed, there has been immediately a shift to seeing more and more people question whether they were really Christians to begin with, uh, and that including some pastors, where they might walk in and sit down initially and say, well, I know I'm a Christian. You know, I accepted Christ. When I was 14, they can tell you the moment, the time, the place, maybe the sermon that was preached or whatever. Say, so I know I became a Christian. You can't take that away from me. Well, in one way, you don't want to if it's genuine. But if it's not genuine, then you want to gently guide them to understanding what does it really mean to, to be a believer, to, to, to live in a righteous kind of way. And, and so I start talking about, and I mentioned this in the book on Defiled, 1 John chapter 3, where it's very clear. John says, if we do not practice righteousness, then we are not of God. And he uses a very strong statement. We're actually of Satan, which is, you know, just, I don't want to look at myself that way. But, but it's very clear if you look at that passage, I'm either practicing righteousness or I'm practicing unrighteousness. Now, not perfectly, the, the righteousness, but the difference is I'm either a part of God or I'm a part of Satan. And, and then John says that Christ came to destroy the works of Satan. And, 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 and so there, there is a clear dividing line, and I must be on one side or I must be on the other side. So to me, uh, to me it's a matter of saying to even a pastor or to any person who claims to be a believer, but given your level of practice, where you have continually engaged, chosen to engage, deliberately gone in this direction, even though you hate it, even though you despise it, even though you swear you'll never do it again, even though you cry out to God to take it away, that you still go back and you do it again. If that is not practicing, then I, I, I don't know what it is. And, and so I'm not totally trying to tear the person's faith down in the sense of well, you're not a Christian. I think the most loving, gentle, kind thing to really offer to the person is, given what you've been doing, given how you've been living in blatant sin, maybe it's appropriate to say, have I ever really chosen to follow Christ and, and, and to live for righteousness? Am I really living for myself in terms of the sexual sin? And then from there, I think you can start to say, but what other areas do you live for yourself? What do you, what do, you do in terms of the clothes you wear, the car you drive, uh, the, the, the way you go about life in general in, in a thousand different areas of your life? How much is it all about you versus the will of God? Uh, and, and again, trying to point out where's the self-centeredness, how deeply ingrained is it? Uh, and, and therefore, you're, it's like building a case in a court of law where you build the evidence and you say, okay, 
Okay, conclusion, the jury now has to convene and say, okay, based upon the evidence pre presented here, that there's a preponderance or there's a clear and convincing evidence, this person has real issues on whether they really have come to Christ. Uh, and, and so it's, it's kind of like building, a, to me it's like building a case, and it's individual to the person. It's like looking at each element of their life that may come through the counseling process and saying, is that really, is that really consistent with being a follower of Christ? I think that Scripture teaches that we are to examine ourselves. Paul says that, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, that we are to examine ourselves, we are to test ourselves and say, uh, and, and, and you have these words running through the New Testament, if you are a believer in effect, if you are a follower of Christ. Uh, and, and in one sense, the Scripture is very reassuring that we are, yet at the same time, Many of the scriptures will then say, but then there needs to be a change. And a lot of times that change has to do with our sexuality. You know, I think when you look at a new Christian, a truly new convert, where we would say of this person how they lived, their lifestyle, uh, their lack of anything in terms of God, interest in God, interest in the Word of God, uh, was not a part of their life. and. An event occurs where they believe in Jesus Christ, they understand the cross and accept Christ by faith, all we understand in terms of what it means to be a Christian. That person is, in, is like a newborn baby. We've, we've used that analogy for as long as I've been around, and I'm sure longer than I've been around. Uh, that person needs to grow up. Uh, Hebrews talks about the idea and, and gives it as a warning that we should, by this time, be teachers rather than, in effect, still sucking on a milk bottle. And, and, and so I, I think if, if we looked with real biblical lenses at people's lives, we have the truly new Christian who was just converted rather recently. He's a baby, and we expect him to be immature, to have a lack of understanding. But take a decent amount of time, 10 years down the road, there needs to be something very, very different, is what that passage in Hebrews is saying. They really, really need to be living a different life and not continuing to feed on a bottle. I mean, it's a very, very derogatory image when you think of, a, say, a 12-year-old in, in actual human life still sucking on a bottle. We'd say, what is wrong with the parents, you know, that this child is still uh, not eating meat but eating, drinking milk from a bottle? Like, like an infant.